welcome everybody. I am Scorch13. I'm very excited to be bringing you another video today. Uh, some of you may have seen my part one of the card review for the Resurgence expansion for Feria, which is kind of right in the middle of release right now. Uh, one of the things that I want to do going forward for each expansion is kind of take a look back once the meta has settled around that. And that means today we are going to be looking at the Fall of Everlife, which was Feria's first expansion. Uh, that part two of that expansion released just over a month ago now. Uh, so one of the things that I want to look back on is uh, kind of expectations of what I thought for those cards. Now, unfortunately, I didn't do card reviews at that time uh, when those cards were released, but something that I want to do as we get more and more expansions in Feria is take a look back at what the expectations were on where those cards would fit into either decks that already existed or creating new decks, and then kind of analyze how the, the meta has developed and then where those cards fit now uh, compared to how they fit within the expansion release timing. And then uh, now, of course, as we get further past part one, part two, and then now uh, kind of another set coming out as well. So uh, it should be hopefully quicker than my card review videos just because there isn't as much theoretical. There's more actual data to back it up. Uh, again, just like the card reviews, I'm going to be going through it exactly as you see it on the Feria uh, site for their news article for all of the cards. So let's just jump into it. Uh, first card we had is Imperial Drake Rider. Uh, very interesting card when it was released. Of course, with the first part of Fall of Everlife, we had the Corrupt mechanic. A lot of people thought we're going to be very, very strong mechanics, and it turns out that you actually can have quite a bit of counterplay. Imperial Drake Rider really was uh, kind of rampant right at the start, more due to the fact that yellow, flying yellow control was seen quite a bit, and this card fit perfectly into there. You had extra movement ability to get the Corrupt, and as soon as you triggered it, you're able to get some very good early value trades. Now, of course, since that time, uh, Manta Rider did lose some of its power, and then because that deck hasn't been seen as much, uh, we haven't seen Drake Rider quite as much. You will still see it from some players here and there, uh, but even just yellow control as an archetype has really stopped running this card. So it's gone through a big dip where it was very strong right off the start, uh, as I think a lot of people expected it to be. But it's not that the card itself has decreased in power or decreased in the meta, uh, but just the deck that it was kind of featured in the most isn't seen as much, so it's lost its power in that regard. Next card we're going to have a look at is Chaos, the Demented Overlord, or Overmind, uh, was the first second print of a card. We, of course, had a Chaos released in Oversky about a year ago, and then we had the second Chaos printed in the fall of Everlife. Uh, his Corrupt was very interesting when it came out. I thought he would actually be the strongest card of the set. And while he was experimented with quite a bit uh, by a lot of people, we ended up seeing him find a, a slot sometimes in blue. And then uh, some people were using it in green, but it, it wasn't really found in, in quite a few other control style archetypes. Um, is very good in an OTK situation where you can set certain things up. I myself personally love running him in my Blue Reaver deck just because you're able to uh, set your opponent down to 10 and then because of the amount of corrupt charges you're usually able to get off, he ends up being a one-hit kill. Uh, my expectation certainly was not lived up to with this card just because we don't really see it in that many uh, decks right now. Next one up is the Imperial Trooper. Uh, corrupt gain control of this creature's land. A very interesting archetype. Uh, of course, you're stepping onto your opponent's land to trigger that ability, so you then take control of that. Um, I think kind of looked at as an anti-aggro tool, uh, potentially an aggro, uh, a, a tool for aggro as much as anything. Um, as much as anti-aggro, I should say, just because you're able to potentially step onto your opponent's land and then stop playing, stop them from playing anything in that space as well. Um, but it just didn't end up really finding a home in anything. Uh, we ended up 
I at least I uh, ended up just kind of dismissing this card right off the bat, and maybe a lot of people did as well, and you know just haven't experimented with it enough. I assume there would be people who have toyed around with it and just never found a home for it. This creature just really never took off into any deck at all. Next one up, however, Shadow Silk Fairy uh, was one that actually did see a lot of play. Uh, still does see play in decks here and there. If you're looking to find the right card at the right time, you're able to trigger this in something like yellow, pull some removal or some uh, movement type events. It was played in blue for a while um, just because you're, again, able to pull removal if you need to. Not too often seen in green, um, and there was actually the odd time that we've seen Shadow Silk Fairy in red as well, uh, just to pull certain control options from there, whether it was for burst or, or removal. Uh, the big thing with Shadow Silk Fairy is we have other cards that exist that were already being used to target things like this. Uh, at the time, some red control decks were very... Uh, popular, so you had like Ground Shaker in there, and then of course it can be finished off by something like Cypher's Wrath. We also had Emperor's Command being very prevalent in the meta, and still is very prevalent in the meta. So Shadow Silk Fairy has lost quite a bit of its, I'll call it popularity, uh, but it is still one of probably the highest played cards uh, from the, the first chunk of the Fall of Everlife set. Next up on the list, we have Leia, Lady of Sorrows, who is, again, like the Shadow Silk Fairy, one of the most played, especially for control decks. You have the Death Touch on her, really good at removal uh, early on in the game. A lot of Blue Reaver decks picked up Leia, not only for the extra removal, the, the potential time that it gives you, but you also have the Shimmering Statue, which has Taunt. Uh, that's able to potentially keep your opponent, if they're Rush, uh, style archetype away from hitting your orb as well as recovering the life as well if you are running something like a, a blue that's running forbidden libraries that damage that's gonna tick onto your orb every single turn is negated a little bit by the shimmering statue once leia uh, is dead on the board uh, i had leia as i thought uh, one of the more interesting archetypes or design um, cards from the first part of Fall of Everlife. And I had her kind of mid-range. I wasn't really that high on Leia's ability, but she's definitely been one of the strongest that was released. Uh, just a massive amount of value you can get out of a control tool like her, and she's just been seen in so many different decks. Next up, we have the Blight Blade Knight. Uh, I saw this as basically being a similarity to Shaitan Demon. I just didn't see it replacing Shaitan Demon in any, any yellow tempo decks. We saw it for a little bit once the card was actually released, but it just never really took off from there. Just because of the max potential that it can da deal damage to you, it just wasn't good enough to take the place of anything um, that it was kind of similar to in any deck that wanted to run it. Next up is the Deranged Monkey. Now, I actually pulled this from um, the Fall of Everlife card news article, like I mentioned. So this is actually the pre-nerf stats. Deranged Monkey since has been moved to a 0-1 base stats just because it was so so powerful. Uh, Deranged Monkey, I think, was kind of set up as a design, if you're behind against Rush, for example, um, you can play this. Generally, all the fairy wells are going to be empty, and you'll actually get a really well-statted creature onto the board, but what ended up happening was Monkey was absolutely everywhere in Rush archetypes, just because you weren't collecting, Rush generally doesn't care about focusing on the wells, and that meant that all four generally were open for you on your turn, and you were able to just slam down a 4-6 in the middle of the board, uh, and potentially if your opponent was stabilized in any way, plus one, again, it's a 4-6 coming down. Um, it was you know, so powerful and so prevalent in the meta that it actually had to be nerfed down to that 0-1. Uh, it is still seen here and there, but even just that one damage and uh, for how 
kind of splashed in uh, Punishments were in the meta at the time. Deranged Monkey really hasn't made the comeback uh, to a strong enough point as where it was when it was initially released. Uh, it's very interesting that it was actually nerfed out just because I actually had Monkey as the weakest of the neutrals uh, in this part one of Fall of Everlife, but it just really, really took off in terms of the value that it was able to provide. There was a couple tournaments that we just saw it absolutely everywhere. All right, Lost Explorer is the next one. Corrupt draw a card and gain one, a real resource engine. I experimented with this quite a bit during the part one time of Fall of Everlife, and I really, really enjoyed the card. A uh, little bit of versatility that it's only one wildland requirement, so it is a turn one play, as well as eventually being able to proc its corrupt effect. Gave it kind of that versatility of uh, early game collector, then snowball into mid-game uh, potential value. And generally, if your opponent had to remove it, you didn't lose any value for it as well. So a uh, really strong card. We didn't end up seeing it kind of be a, a strong enough neutral card that it found a home in every deck. But there certainly were some people who liked to run Lost Explorer, myself included. Um, it just kind of didn't have anything specific that it fit into, whether you wanted to run it in any specific color. Uh, I think there were very good uses for it. We just didn't really see it take off to the point that some other cards did. All right, getting into some of the color cards here. The first one up is Flying Piranha. Um, I kind of didn't have high hopes for this card. It in that I didn't see really great ways to proc its ability. Not really successfully, because there are successful ways to uh, proc the Piranha, but kind of just not consistently enough. Um, and then if you did, something else happened in there that your creature died. Potentially it is just normal trades, um, but then you could get the Death Touch and then go in and kill off one of their creatures. Now, it was... A uh, couple decks running it here and there that actually did provide good control over the course of a game and really slowed your opponent down from aggressing towards you because otherwise you could take a really valuable trade with the Piranha. Uh, we just never really saw a deck come about that utilized Piranha to its full ability before some other things started taking over. Of course, only having one attack, as I mentioned earlier on the uh, the Shadow Silk Fairy, the Emperor's Command was and still is quite prevalent in the meta. You're able to decrease the power of this down to a zero attack, and then the death touch really doesn't matter. Uh, it just kind of didn't take over the spot of anything else in blue. There was almost always kind of better early creatures that you wanted to play, and then you would use something like Frogify, uh, potentially Mirror Phantasm to generate a trade, or Aurora uh, to generate a trade up on board, rather than needing the death touch of the Flying Piranha. Next up, we have Reign of Fish. Uh, this was Blue's first AoE-type card. And what actually came about from Reign of Fish uh, ended up, I think, being a lot maybe funnier than the card was intended to be. Uh, we had some very interesting mill deck come about from uh, after Part 2 was released. We'll get to, of course, Rapala later on, but... Um, ES of Dawn came up with the ES of Mill, or S of Mill, uh, always say his name incorrectly, where you spam the board with Reign of Fish, change them all into Hunted Outlaws, and then uh, you Doomsday to kill off the whole board, making your opponent draw a ton of cards, burning everything in the process, and eventually getting them into fatigue very quickly. Uh, I tried a similar version, which was Reign of Fish, and then playing a Cypher's Fodder, and then... Uh, transform all of those with uh, the Ilani's medallion. I don't think this ever kind of hit the intended give blue an AoE um, type card, and it also didn't really fit into like spam stuff onto the board. It did somewhat find a home in Gift of Rakoa decks, but it wasn't really that popular in them as well because they were at the time quite more uh, green focus than going to the four lakes. That being said, this is a card that has had uh, quite a bit of experimentation in it. Um, as much as it hasn't 
in my opinion, kind of found the right home. There have been a lot of different decks that have utilized it in different ways, that it has been uh, quite the staple card of the expansion. Monstrous Hydra comes up next. Again, this is a card that was changed since. It has been buffed to a 5-6. Uh, they just felt giving it that extra one life gave it that extra uh, kind of oomph that it needed, and we still really haven't seen it that much. Again, a card that had a lot of experimentation at the start, but even when you're able to proc the Corrupt char um, ability and get the Hydras with haste, they just weren't ever able to do enough damage or gain enough value that Hydra really became kind of a staple card of some kind of blue mid-range deck. Uh, it was very interesting to see what people tried at the start of it, and I had kind of high hopes for this card off the start because um, I kind of anticipated getting a lot of value out of Hydra, and it just never really panned out that way. Getting into green now, we have Rotting Boar, uh, which I thought was going to be a lot better, uh, maybe not a lot better uh, is the right wording, but a lot kind of more prevalent in the meta. We actually did see for quite a while a green Beastmaster deck uh, come back about a little bit. Now, of course, Rotting Boar was uh, a deck that was found in that deck, but it was kind of just not powerful enough, I'll say, to find its way into some of the other splashed color, uh, the green-blue, especially once Huntdown was released in Part 2. We saw a green-blue beast deck come about that didn't really feature Rotting Boar. Uh, I believe it was really only seen in that green Beastmaster style, and while that was kind of something that brought Mono Green back into the meta, uh, it just wasn't a card that ended up finding its way into a lot of other decks. Hunted Willow comes up next as, I believe, the worst, maybe not worst, but like least seen card of the expansion. Uh, I really like the flavor of it being the reverse of the Living Willow. Um, my initial assessment on this, I thought maybe there's a green rush that comes to the forefront, and it's because of the fact that if you get Haunted Willow attack in or trade into a creature, that then opens up an alley for your next creature. You know, maybe it helps that, but we just never saw that archetype develop. And as such, Haunted Willow has just kind of gone by the wayside in terms of uh, its viability from this expansion. Next up is Nico Mata, another uh, quite unseen card. It again is got that beast tag on here, something that was released in the fall of everlife was the beast t subtype tag um the corrupt was kind of just not enough for this creature four forests didn't really mean it could be played in anything other than mono green uh my initial assessment was just if this had jump it would be absolutely insane if it had maybe a, a dash that could allow you to prop the corrupt a little better it would be good as well but the taunt was just a little weak uh, in terms of what you could actually do with it and the corrupt didn't make it any better uh so we just never really saw this card take off into anything either all right, for red, the first one we have up is Havoc, which was another very, very prevalent card. Red Control really uh, found a new home, I would say, in the Fall of Everlife because a card like this, which I really undervalued at the start, uh, this was kind of red's single target removal, and it, it is an exact removal in the way that something like a, a Last Nightmare is from the classic um, cards available in yellow, but... The fact that you could deal 9 damage and efficiently deal with a big creature, which has kind of always been what Red has struggled at, uh, really gave an opening for Red Control to grow. Uh, we've since seen nerfs to Firestorm and Gift of Steel, which have decreased the power of a lot of other cards in Red. Uh, but if Mono Red is to stay relevant going forward, Havoc is a big part of that. And the other card that we saw kind of slot into that red control as well, Baldurian. Uh, I think a lot of people were very, very high on this card coming out. Um, I had it as the strongest of red in my opinion, just because of the power that Hammer of Destruction gives. This has been one of the uh, treasures in Pandora that has been talked about the most since 
really Pandora started. The amount of value that you can get from the Hammer of Destruction, not only because of the damage it does, but the fact that it keeps cycling back through your deck. Um, really, really scary thought. But it just ended up being that Corrupt wasn't as easy to trigger, especially in red where you are limited to uh, mono red since this is five mountains. Um, it was just, you know, if you were able to trigger it, you, I think, kind of were already ahead enough that you were going to win the game even without Hammer. It just sealed it so easily for you. So we saw, like I mentioned, uh, Red Control become very, very prevalent in Baldurian in those decks uh, almost every single time. It just didn't end up being a deck that was broken because of Baldurian. It was already other strong pieces that contributed to the power that that deck had throughout the uh, expansion release timing. Next up is the Spite Sprite. This was one of my most interesting cards from part one, uh, one that I was the most excited for because we really hadn't seen a lot of support for the red angry archetype uh, and then of course the red yellow angry that existed way back in the day of uh, early access Feria. And I was really excited to try this card out to see if, you know, a turn one play could then cycle into a lot of board control and then cycle into your big Firebringers and uh, discounted Hate Seeds. But uh, whether I was the only one, I'll, I'll never know. Uh, I just never really saw anyone else experimenting with it. Uh, the two damage to yourself generally was just two damage to yourself. You weren't able to combine that into anything else that uh, kind of combos with the self-orb damage, uh, and it just kind of never took off into anything. Now, we just had Resurgence um, launch last week, and there is a little bit more support for those cards in there, so we'll have to see as the meta develops if this is something that was kind of the long-term game where it was released in the expansion before it becomes really prevalent in the meta. But as far as just during the, the release of Fall of Everlife, this card really didn't see much play at all. Demonic Salmon comes up next in yellow. Um, I was very concerned seeing this card because it was another Salmon printed when we had Flash Salmon released. It was so powerful that eventually they gave it Divine, so you couldn't cycle it uh, for the attack to the orb and then trigger something like a, a Wrangler, Demon Wrangler for the sacrifice. I thought Demonic Salmon would basically just take the place of the Flash Salmon in Yellow Rush. Uh, now what has happened is Demonic Salmon fits into Yellow Rush, but we don't see that type of sac rush anymore. Uh, turns out that the Demonic Salmon getting the extra buffs and being a 2-2, potentially the next turn becoming a 3-3 and getting bigger and bigger from there, was actually more valuable than the sacrifice um, synergy that ended up being kind of prevalent with the Salmon before. So you, while yes, it has found a home in Yellow Rush, uh, it didn't really change the archetype back the way that I was expecting. It has been a very strong card in that deck, so it, it definitely has been one of the stronger cards from part one of the Fall of Everlife. Uh, it just didn't really turn out the way that I expected, um, but definitely a very, very strong card. Solemn comes up next in yellow, which was the legendary released. Um, I had a difficult time analyzing this card initially because immediately being four deserts, you think of it going into a yellow control style, uh, which is an archetype that generally has extra mobility and just out collects your opponent until the point that you just starve them out of the game. And I looked at this and went, why would you want to destroy a well when your game plan is generally quad collecting? Um, we did see it here and there, and it does turn out that sometimes you can get some good value out of it where you force your opponent to one side of the board, you control the other, and then you cut their economy in half. But those are generally games, in my opinion, where you're playing an archetype that eventually does that anyway. So I just never saw the value that Solemn could actually provide. Uh, of course, it is divine, so it does have that kind of end game 
um, ability to just hit the orb for seven when your opponent can't do anything about it. But the divine on there also means that you can't use things like Flashwind, Fanatic, uh, extra movement to get Solemn into the right place to either hit the orb, trigger the corruption, uh, maybe make a, a valuable trade. I just didn't see kind of all of the pieces coming together for this card, and it just never found a home in any kind of control type archetypes, which is the only spot that I thought it would end up in, and it just never did. However, the final card from part one, Spirit Theft, had a lot of play across quite a few yellow decks. Uh, Spirit Theft was actually changed since this as well. I believe it is one, uh, I'm just going to double check this here, but I believe it is uh, two deserts, yeah, two deserts and two wild. Um, this card was absolutely insane at the start, and of course, because yellow was being played so often, we had tournaments where uh, you would see players playing either Drake Riders or Manta Riders off the start, deal a little bit of damage, finish it with Spirit Theft, and you'd end up just seeing you know, a yellow versus yellow mirror match where there was one Manta Rider basically bouncing from a player's hand onto the board, into the opponent's hand, back onto the board, back, like, just back and forth like a tennis match with a single creature. Um, the fact that it becomes wild land requirements was absolutely insane for this card. Uh, even, you know, a handful of yellow rush archetypes that showed up were running it just because of the power that it can provide. Deal that one extra damage to clear off a value trade that your opponent took, and you generate an extra card value into your hand, so you can do other things rather than drawing, hoping for a creature every single time. Uh, this is definitely one of the most well-represented cards, I think, uh, throughout the course of the expansion. We saw even blue yellow events style decks running this just because it does create extra cards um it was you know mono yellow at the start but since the change to make it two wilds it definitely has been seen in some dual color decks as well uh this is definitely i think one of the more uh played cards from the first part of the expansion and it ends part one so we are going to kick into part number two which introduced the Rakoan and Yax subtypes. Um, I shouldn't say introduced them, but introduced a, a lot of support tools for them. Uh, first up is the Rakoan Illusionist. Now, interesting one with this some people found was that if you use the Illusionist on a card that you had turned into a Dune Drake, it'll turn back into a Dune Drake, so you could kind of uh, cheat out a card that way. It was just a lot of resources used. Now, this card was bugged, and I want to say at the time that I'm recording this is still bugged, that you were able to cast it on anything. It didn't have to be a Rakoan. And, you know, kind of thought that that would end up making it more played than it actually was. It just turned out that Rakoan decks needed a lot to work. They needed a lot of lands, and they needed kind of the right creatures in the right order, and they were also very weak to a lot of things. You were weak to AoE, you were weak to small removal, uh, and you were weak to big creatures because you didn't have any removal. So it just ended up being that while a lot of people experimented with a lot of different things in the Rakoan subtype, uh, it just never really blossomed into something that was strong enough. And Rako the Rakoan Illusionist, I think, was one of the weaker ones as well. Uh, even though some of the other Rakoans found homes in other decks, uh, Illusionist just never really developed into anything. One of the cards that did find a home in other decks was the Rakoan Shieldmates. Uh, this was actually seen quite a bit in Green Yellow Sack. Um, I actually should have double checked if the um, Green Yellow Sack that was played in the Blitz tournament. Uh, use the shield mates in it as well, but uh, this was one that I immediately thought of, uh, even outside of the, the Rakoan subtype. The fact that you get a low-cost creature onto the board, which once it dies, summons another creature that you can use as either sacrifice targets or just small trades to get your bone collector rolling in a green yellow sack you of course get your soul leaders uh, buffed as well it was an archetype that was still seen quite often so this is definitely one of the big ones uh, not because of the rakoan synergy but just because it perfectly fit into a deck that already existed 
All right, Rakoan Recruiter, uh, green, blue meant it fit into some of the Gift of Rakoan decks that we were seeing, uh, where you would have few creatures on board, you would then play a few more small ones. This, of course, gave you an extra free creature out of hand, and then you would play Gift of Rakoa for a big burst of damage. Um, personally, even still having seen that archetype, I have not seen Rakoa and Recruiter in it, and I'm not exactly sure if the only reason for that is the deck was already so refined that there wasn't really anything that you could take out to then pop in the Recruiter. Um, I haven't seen a lot of discussion on it, whether that was the case or not, but then something else that happened within this set uh, was we saw another green-blue archetype develop as well. So that type of, um, call it mid-range archetype, where you were just playing smaller stuff onto the board, frog tossers, a lot of small creatures, and then Gift of Rokoa, that archetype did uh, kind of fall to the side a little bit. It is still seen uh, quite often here and there, but Rakoan Recruiter, for whatever reason, just didn't find its home in that deck, and that was really the only situation that uh, it was going to see play outside of an all Rakoan deck, as I already mentioned, didn't really come to the forefront of the meta. Rakoan Cannoneer, another one that I was very interested in, again, like I mentioned uh, a little earlier for the red-yellow angry archetype because it has that higher attack. Uh, of course, the real benefit here is that you can play some of the smaller Rakoans that already uh, exist in the subtype we've already looked at here. Sacrifice one of them, deal three damage to something. Very, very interesting as well because it is deal three damage, not just deal three damage to a creature that you could use this on the orb uh, for some kind of red, yellow, burn, uh, Rakoan style. Unfortunately, that just never really developed. Uh, Cannoneer is still seen here and there, but it just needs the other Rakoans to be uh, on the board, have that synergy with that style. If it was something else where it was just kind of deal the damage by itself, this card would be very, very well represented in the meta, I think. Uh, but the fact that it kind of needs the Rakoans synergy and the only other um, one that kind of fit in that style of a burn uh, type archetype would be the Rakoan Chieftain, which is kind of too powerful a card to be used as a sacrifice target, but then not powerful enough to be seen in those style of decks already. So this never really found a home outside of uh, the Rakoan subtype deck. Next up is the Rakoan War Leader, uh, which green-red, of course, has the combat in there as well. We've since seen Gift of Seal nerf, so it wasn't able to uh, kind of benefit from that anymore. The other thing is if you're running that style, you want to run more combat creatures and those aren't Rakoans. So you kind of get split wanting to play a few different things and it just never really developed into anything. Uh, even the kind of green-red Salamander, green-red Crackthorn decks that we were seeing for quite a while didn't play this either. Next up is the Rakoan War Machine. Uh, this was actually a really cool one that I saw quite a bit. Um, you may swallow another friendly Rakoan to gain stats. That means you can then trade up and you have that creature left behind. Of course, that also means that it has swallowed the creature and it can't be swallowed by Crystal Flower or uh, Sky Whale in a situation where your opponent needs to remove it for that purpose. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, I actually did see this quite a bit in terms of decks that weren't all in on Rakoan, um, but had a couple of them here and there, and then played the War Machine to buff up and defend. It was actually really good against Rush. Um, one of the things I'll talk about a few cards from now is I tried out a Yak Rush uh, archetype, and I actually saw this as a really good counter to it quite a few times. Uh, just never really developed as a red-blue or the Rakoan subtype archetype to push to the front of the meta, and we just haven't really seen it be that strong outside of those decks. Rakoan Champion is the next one up, uh, of course, kind of your end game creature to the Rakoan subtype. A lot of the Rakoans are really small, and the champion is that uh, kind of powerhouse coming down at the end where you have a bunch on the board, slam the Rakoan Champion down, and now your opponent has this big thing to deal with. 
The only problem with that was the Rakoan subtype deck never really got pushed to the front, and none of the other ones were really that big. So any of your opponent's big removal, uh, whether it was things like Crystal Flower for the Swallow, Last Nightmare, Frogify, whatever the case may be in terms of their removal, uh, Rakoan Champion is just the target for it. There, there was never really anything else that pushed your opponent to have to use those cards earlier on. And as long as you're in about a neutral game, whatever the Rakoan Champion came down as, it could be immediately dealt with. Um, I think that was kind of the big thing that the Rakoan archetype never really got pushed to the front because kind of every stage of the game, it had good counters. You start off with small creatures onto the board, depending on what ones you're playing. They're weak to either AoE or small removal, or just straight up trades. Your opponent can take very valuable trades into them because they are smaller creatures. If you were able to set up onto the board, you were never really able to trade and generate extra value so that you could then, you know, take over and start out collecting your opponent at three to two, three to one wells, whatever the case may be. And then if you were in an even state game, slamming something like this down onto the board, it was fairly easy for your opponent to deal with. So I think that was kind of the real um, hindering factor of the Rakoan subtype was that it just kind of had the right removal at uh, quite a few stages of the game. Final Rakoan here is Rakoa Copter. Now this one was actually seen quite a bit in the green-red. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, War Leader really wasn't. This actually was seen quite a bit because you were able to play things like the Rakoan, you were able to play uh, the Salamander, and then Crackthorn, and you actually had a lot of area control, as well as this being a creature that had flying, could go far side if you needed to, um, and then was just another creature to get onto the board for the buffs. Uh, since that deck has kind of fallen out of... Uh, the meta a little bit. It's still seen here and there, but it's just certainly not as strong as it was at the time of release. And Rakoan Copter was actually seen in that quite a bit. Again, never found a home in the, excuse me, in the Rakoan subtype, but was seen quite a bit in Green Red. All right, we get now into our second subtype release, which was the Yaks, like I mentioned. Uh, Sapphire Yak is the first one up here. Um, I was very interested in Sapphire Yak, but it kind of wasn't seen that much. I saw it a handful of times on ladder. It needed a lot to get going. Uh, you really needed it to be in the right position and then kind of snowball that into either itself or another Yak collecting. And it was just kind of easy to deal with before it got rolling. Uh, I actually did see a couple really interesting ones of like blue yellow. You're able to play Sapphire y Yak and then the Topaz Yak. Because it has haste, it would then collect from the well and it would get the buff right away. Very interesting in that style. But then quite a few other decks kind of took over that had the extra mobility. They were able to deal with this card before it was really able to get any of that those buffs going. Um, that being said, there were a handful of times that I saw on the ladder uh one or two of these played and you just snowball the game out of control from there. It just wasn't really a, a deck that was strong enough in the current meta to ever really get pushed to the front where the yaks were just running crazy. Next up is the mother of all yaks. This was our end game. Um, of course, cost one for each friendly yak that has died. It cost one less, sorry, for each friendly yak that has died this game. You would potentially build a deck of all yaks, eventually get this down to nothing, and then you would be able to flood out a few big creatures onto the board because you would have the mother as well as the two yak guards. Unfortunately, we just never really saw a yak subtype come to the forefront. We saw yaks splashed into decks here and there, uh, especially the ruby yak was seen quite a bit, um, but there was never really enough of a yak-centric deck to see uh, Mother of Yaks have a lot of play. It, of course, was played in that specific deck, but just never really seen uh, too often. Ruby Yak, as I mentioned, uh, was actually kind of the heart of an OTK that was out there. You would play a couple Yaks and then something like Famine. 
um, maybe Famine Plague Bear, get a bunch of triggers at the same time, and then for each Ruby Yak that you had on board, it would deal you know, exponential damage based on how many yaks you had. Uh, very similar to something that I, I love to do in Pandora that I did way back, which was the uh, collection with the golem. And then you get the burn down that way. It's very interesting to see that come about. Uh, I love running Ruby Yak in my Yak Rush just because if your opponent's dealing with it, you're dealing burn damage to them as well. Um, never really found, like I mentioned, a Yak-centric subtype uh, archetype um, deck that was just all Yaks together. But it actually was played quite a bit in other uh, type decks, whether it was Mono Red or something like that OTK. This is, I think, yeah, I think this is probably the most um, seen yak out of part two of Fall of Every Life. Next one up is Emerald Yak, uh, giving you the extra creature again. Uh, was seen a little bit in Sacrifice because you can get that 1-1 one, one down and then Sacrifice it. Was also seen a little bit in some kind of Yak Synergy decks. Uh, wasn't really too much in Gift of Rakoa, even though it was able to generate an extra token onto the board, an extra creature that then buffed Gift of Rakoa. Um, it was, I would say, just experimented with, but never really found its home. Uh, it was, I, I think... Kind of unfortunate as well because it is a card that looks like it could fit in a lot of different things, and it just never really lived up to that in the end. Final Yak here is the Topaz Yak, which I mentioned I was experimenting with right of, uh, off the bat when this set was released. I really, really like this card um, just because of the kind of ability that it gives. Summon it next to a friendly Yak means you don't necessarily need a desert in that location. Then it gains haste as well. Really strong in terms of getting a beneficial trade, dealing four damage to the orb. I, of course, was running this with the long-haired yak. Very natural synergy there. You get the extra buffs from that as well. That's even more damage potential. Um, I really liked running that deck, and it was kind of just yellow rush with topaz yak, ruby yak, and the long-haired yak kind of package. So I think just the strength of yellow rush not necessarily overshadowed the Yak synergy, but really aided that along. Uh, but like I mentioned, I did see Topaz Yak in other decks here and there, and I have seen quite a few other people experimenting with that archetype uh, on ladder as well. So this potentially could be another one of those kind of most seen out of the Yaks. Uh, I think Ruby Yak kind of still takes it, but probably not by too much. Topaz Yak was uh, a really, really interesting one, and one that was actually seen quite a bit through the release of this expansion. All right, next up is the Beast Synergy. Uh, of course, Beast Subtype was introduced, but then had the Synergy cards come out here. Orphan Fugu is a very interesting one because it has a passive ability. Passive abilities in Feria have been something that have been... Uh, kind of played with more and more. They've been releasing more and more content. Of course, we saw the Explorers, the neutral cards that gain buffs depending on the number of lands that you have, used to be a gift and became a more passive ability. Orphan Fugu fits into that same spot. You can play this down first, then play a Beast and get that uh, extra ability trigger afterwards. Because of that, and the next card that I'll get to uh, here, Hunt Down, we saw blue-green beasts actually become one of the dominant decks on meta, uh, out of the meta, sorry. It was a, a really pushed because you were able to get a lot of value out of your creatures, a lot of value out of things like the jump with this and Mystic Beast. All of your creatures generally had five life, which meant the Ancient Boar would get discounted. You'd be able to spam out a bunch of these really mid-rangey creatures onto the board, and then use Hunt Down for either a quick attack as soon as you summon the creature, or a double attack on uh, the turn that you choose to play the Hunt Down, because you could uh, play the... Uh, have the creature down, then on the turn that it can move, hunt down to kill off a creature, then attack into another one. Uh, Orphan Fugu, I think, really aided that in terms of early collection because you were able to play it. You could go 
forest into lake or lake into forest, then play the fugu, and then, like I mentioned, play another creature, another beast, and then the fugu would trigger. Uh, would have been a much, much weaker card had it been a gift ability rather than a passive. All right, next one, like I mentioned, is hunt down. Give a friendly beast plus two, it then fights. Uh, basically kind of green beasts removal in uh, a kind of a way if you want to look at it that way um the fact that you're able to fight any creature not like it gave it range uh, like we saw grappling hook released in the over sky it could be anywhere on the board and like i just mentioned you could double attack with it because you would play hunt down it would attack and then it would have its natural attack for the turn as well so very versatile in the way that you could play it down onto the board get it to trigger right away and also um, play it to attack into either two creatures or clear a creature and then hit the orb. Uh, just the fact that that beast synergy was released pushed a brand new archetype into the meta. It definitely was one of the strongest uh, cards from part two of uh, Fall of Everlife. Legendaries come up next with Maginata. Uh, very interesting card. We got a little teaser of this actually before it was even released. Um, just in terms of kind of what the card text would look like with the swallow and then give that creature plus five, five. Um, some, I don't know if it was just somebody right away or some players uh, discovered that you could actually play this in a green blue, play failed experiment, and then the Maginata would actually still survive as the swallow inside whatever creature you chose to use it on. Um, big thing for it was it was kind of a counter to something like Crystal Flower and the Sky Whale because you can't swallow a creature that has swallowed. So you would buff your creature up and then it would be a little bit harder for your opponent to remove depending on what they were playing. And you would then have Maginata as a 5-5 five, five, uh, in behind afterwards. That being said, it was just too high of a cost. It was too much of a combo for a lot of decks to really run this card. We, we did see some experimentation with it. Like I mentioned, uh, players running it in like a green-blue style, but it was never a card that really got pushed to top-tier decks. Next up is the fun one, Rapala the Dope Fish. Oh, my cropping's kind of off on that one, but that's okay. Um, this is an incredibly fun card to play with. So like I mentioned earlier, um, it saw, Rapala saw play in the uh, S of Mill deck because you would fill your opponent's hand. And then it kind of just also randomly saw play here and there without that type of a combo. Uh, now, since Resurgence has been released, we have some cards that actually need their ability to trigger based on the amount of cards your opponent has in hand. And Rapella has actually gained even more value since because you can play it, fill your opponent's hand, and then trigger those types of effects. Uh, it was a card that really, when it came out, had a lot of controversy around it because it didn't... A lot of people saying that it doesn't feel good when your opponent plays something, it fills your hand and discards cards from your deck, and you're just not able to play with what you actually want to play with. Um, it didn't end up being as oppressive initially as kind of a lot of the complaints warranted because it's only one lake. You could basically just splash it into your deck whenever you wanted to play the lake and then play Rapala, fill your opponent's hand, make them burn at least one card, uh, kind of just fill their hand with junk that they're never going to be able to play, put them on the back foot because of that. And it just never really got to that point, but it has definitely seen quite a bit of play in, um, I'll say the meme decks at first, but now almost not even the meme decks. It's actually part of a strategy of triggering some of your other cards effects since the cards from Resurgence have been released. All right, Lava Surge Axolotl comes in next. Very interesting card at uh, the highest attack that currently exists in Feria. Um, pretty bland in the end just because it doesn't have any card text. It, of course, is a beast, so if you were able to use it in the right way with something like Hunt Down, you know, there is value to that, but it just never really developed into anything because it's very weak, 
in terms of only having three life, very weak to any removal that your opponent could have, but you also almost never needed this much attack to do anything. It was, it was too weak to actually hit your opponent's orb and be a big chunk of damage that way, but it was too little life to really survive. Um, it was just too much attack to kind of need that much to trade into something where some kind of mid-range card couldn't just take the place of it. Um, I think quite a few people were experimenting with it in different situations. Uh, kind of the, the couple that come to mind, I don't actually think I saw any of this, but you could use it if you're able to get it discounted for Illusion of Grandeur, pick up a lot of attack that way. And then also you could use it and then have it die off for something like a Shade and Monstrosity and get a big buff of attack that way. But uh, really, those types of out-of-the-box synergies never came into a deck that was in the forefront. And uh, Lava Surge Axolotl just hasn't really seen too much play as far as what I've seen. Ghost Dragon kind of fits into that same type of thing. Uh, of course, it's a 6-0, so it dies right away. Did see... Quite a bit of experimentation with things like Shate and Monstrosity. We saw Shate and Monstrosity OTK, actually, where you would have a Monstrosity on board, just drop Ghost Dragons, uh, really for no reason other than to give plus six attack to your Monstrosity. It just wasn't a deck that really ever came, um, like I've said quite a bit, to the forefront of the meta. Uh, it was also a little awkward to play in a deck that allowed um, buff synergy out of the hand, you really had to focus cards around getting the Ghost Dragon in uh, the right situations to get those buffs, whether it was from green or even from something like neutral like Court Jester. And those types of decks just didn't really need a card like this in it. And then you just didn't kind of ever have the right synergy for Ghost Dragon to be seen outside of, like I mentioned, that OTK uh, that we saw a little bit. But that was, again, maybe one of those kind of meme situations rather than just uh, a good deck. Uh, even something because it has the flying, like Driscar Sky Captain buffing it, Ghost Dragon was never really seen in those decks just because the, the rest of the archetype was already so strong, already so refined. Uh, it just never really found its place. Final card coming up here is the Lionfish. Flying Death Touch, again, zero attack. So because it has Death Touch, you had to find a way to buff it somehow. Now, because it was only, or I should say is only one desert, we actually did see a green-yellow Flyers, which was developed late into the expansion. Um, just saw it, in fact, in the past weekend's tournament from when I'm recording this, which was the halftime tournament. Uh, very interesting to see you could get it down and then uh, the situation that we saw it in actually had Overgrown Tower give it the at extra attack, gave it extra life to actually survive the trade when it traded in as well. So um, it was a card that you kind of had to play around with to find the right situation where you could get the buff onto it. And we actually did see this deck come about because of it in that, that green-yellow flyers. Now that is a lesser seen deck, so a card that's not as well represented in the current meta, but uh, definitely an interesting one in the end. Uh, and that's going to do it for my look back. Um, overall, I think for being the, the first expansion in a year from Feria, uh, part one was definitely stronger than part two. But I think that that was just because part two was so focused on having things like your Rakoan and your Yak Synergy, all cards that needed to be in the same deck together. And they could just never really keep up into monocolored decks. Uh, that being said, some of the cards in Part 2 were actually the strongest in terms of creating new archetypes. Um, I think that it did a pretty good job in terms of their design philosophy of you don't necessarily need to buy the expansion to stay competitive. A lot of decks that we're seeing be really well represented as Tier 1 in the meta are actually decks that use either all or maybe 90% um, range of all base set cards. There are, of course, a lot of uh, strong cards within the Fall of Everlife, but they weren't necessarily defining enough. For example, with the Corrupt Mechanic, 
that you had to play it, that you were forced to buy the expansion in order to stay competitive. Um, I think it's a really, really good thing from their design philosophy that that is able to kind of hold up. Um, and I hope it does continue because so far from what we saw from part one of Resurgence, I think they've stuck to that very well. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed my look back at the Fall of Everlife expansion. Uh, feel free to leave your comments below if you enjoyed, subscribe to this video. You can also find me on Twitch, of course, streaming on Metagaming TV. Leave us a follow there. Um, you can see myself and, of course, my community member, Scream112, and our new newest member, uh, Primus Pillis. That's a new for me for now, guys. Thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you next time.